Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so the next few hours, um, we're going to take a look at wild coffee. It's going to be a little bit left field. It's going to be um, yeah, something a little bit different. So I hope you get something out of it. Uh, I geared it sort of towards the speciality coffee side of things, <coughs> rather than the big industry. Um, and please, if you have any questions, or if you're not sure about something, just in interact. So I'm from Kew Gardens in London. It's a large botanical garden, which the public sees. That's what they uh, perceive. It's a gardens. But behind all those glass houses and high walls, uh, it's a scientific institute. So we're about 700 staff and about 300 dedicated to uh, botanical science in one form or, or another. Q goes back to uh, the 1700s, mid 1700s. Has a very long history. Sorry. Oh, is that, oh, is that better? Can everyone hear? Oh, oh well, that. Wow. Yeah. Great. Um, so, but the botanical side, the science side, really kicks off in about the 1850s. And this is a slide from the late 1800s of one of Q's more famous scientists. So it was. A botanic garden interested in pretty things, in building a collection of uh, exciting and beautiful plants and flowers. But the other side was building empire. It was about economics. It was about money. It was about providing incomes for those people uh, spread around uh, the empire during, those, during the empire, empire era. And this is a, a coffee truck in, in Kenya. Now, the history of coffee science at Kew really goes back to day one. And we've had a continual link since the sort of 1800s, I suppose. And these days, we do a broad range of scientific activities on coffee. What I'm going to talk about today uh, doesn't include all of this. As I've said, we're going to focus on, on the wild species. My background is biodiversity research, and in short, that's understanding what we have on our planet, what wild botanical resources we have on this globe of ours. Now, my journey with coffee started in 1997, purely by chance. I was looking for a postdoc project. This thing happened to come up. A uh, project in Madagascar with an element of coffee research. It sounded like fun. So in 1997, I found myself in Madagascar. Now, I had a botanical background before I started that project. Uh, and when I asked my peers uh, some sort of fundamental questions, they were unable to answer them. So how many coffee species are there? What, well, actually, what is coffee? and how are the species related. And it just amazed me that in the 20th century, it was the 20th century then, that we didn't have these answers to these fundamental questions for what is the world's most important agricultural community and supports the livelihoods of 100 million people worldwide. So there's, here are the three fundamental questions. What is coffee? How many species are there? And how are, are they rela related? And we'll see why that has significance you know, throughout this talk. I just want to clarify one thing before I start, and that is what is a species. So I've put two species up here, the dog and the coffee. So the genus is the Latin name group for, that you put the species within. These are the species, Arabica and lupus, sorry, Canis lupus, the dog, Coffea arabica, genus species, and here are the common names. So here we have our wolf, this is a wild species, and here we have our modern dog, the same species. So all the dogs in the world, whether it's a Dalmatian or a Great Dane, that's one species derived from the wolf. And as you see, quite modified by 
humankind over the last few thousand years. And there are other examples, of course. Now, we think of our coffees. Here are our species. And all the other nodes on the tree, these are our man-made variants of the species. And we call them not varieties or varietals, as they do in, in wine, but cultivars. And cultivars is short for cultivated variety. And the key's there, it's cultivated. So all these lines are either derived from mutations, selections, or hybridization. Another way of thinking about that is here are the species. These are some coffee species from Madagascar. These individual colors represent the species, and the variation within that species, uh, if this was Arabica, for example, those would be your mutations or cultivars. So the varieties, sorry, the cultivars are encapsulated in the variation of the species and are derived from the species. The two beverage species we have, of course, Arabica and, and Robusta. We know those very well. But what about the other species? What do we know about them? The first coffee species to be described by science was described by the Swedish uh, naturalist Carl Linnaeus. At that time, in 1753, only one species was known, and it was called Arabica because they thought it came from Arabia. And we'll see that that's actually not the case. Let's jump forward to the 20th century. A lot of botanical research in between Linnaeus and, and uh, the 19, say, 1950s. I think one man stands out um, as probably the most knowledgeable about coffee species, and that's Auguste Chevalier, the French botanist and explorer. He wrote the last, pop, no, last uh, detailed account of coffee. Uh, his last work was in 1947. So uh, that was the last major work. I think the world has changed quite significantly since then, so more research is required. And Chevalier was not only a great naturalist and explorer, he knew coffee really well. And he actually set up his own research, well, a research institute in West Africa. He traveled widely in Africa and Asia. So in the 80s and the 90s, things start to, started to gather momentum. A colleague of mine from Brussels was working on the West African species. My boss, my predecessor, she was a coffee uh, person. She worked on East African species. Loire in Paris worked on species from the Indian Ocean Islands of the Mascarenes, somewhat on Madagascar. But this was a really big unknown. We didn't really know what the diversity of coffee was in Madagascar. So here I am in 1997, my first trip, the remit to understand coffee diversity in Madagascar. There was some interest from industry because the species are caffeine-free. Other than that, uh, pretty much unknown. There was about 20-odd species described to science from Madagascar, but nobody really knew what they were about. Nobody had really seen them. So uh, for those of you who don't know Madagascar, the eastern side is wet and the western side is dry. It's been isolated from Africa for 200 million years, and lots of very uh, exciting and interesting plants and animals have evolved on this island. So <laughs> one of the things I found really difficult when I, when I first went there was actually finding any coffee. Uh, incredibly restricted, inc incredibly localized. And then I met this guy, a Malagasy uh, s scientist uh, called Frank Rokotina Solo, and he seemed to have a sixth sense about coffee, and he was able to tutor me <laughs> over the next few years to find, uh, help me find the coffees. And Frank and I have worked together for about 15 years. So this is the ideal scenario. It's a nice, bright, sunny day. You're in your Land Rover. You've got everything you need. It's all very comfortable. And yeah, sure, you can find your species. Some of them are by the roadside or accessible. This is Coffea richardii, one of the species described 
uh, by Loire. Very big fruits, enormous fruits, and big, tough, leather, leathery leaves. And this grows right on the seaside, at very low altitudes. As you can see, it has big fruits, but it doesn't have big seeds. So it has a very big, fleshy uh, uh, fruit wall. So the other, end, the other extreme is Coffea buxifolia. This is a species from the high uh, areas of Madagascar up to the snow line. It has little tiny leaves like a bulk myrtle, like a box, small flowers, and really tiny fruits and seeds. But if you really want to um, get the most out of Madagascar, you've got to get out of the car and walk. This is us walking into uh, a site an un unexplored site in northern Madagascar, and this is kind of typical. There are no roads. If, they are, if there are roads, they're covered with water. And people always say to me, wow, it must be great, you know, going visiting all these places. Uh, it's, all, it's all very exciting. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, a counter view. This is us leaving in the morning, nice clean white shirts, big smiles. This is us eight hours later. <laughs> I look, I look about 90 years old, and even the Malagasy guys are looking pretty exhausted. Let's just go back, compare and contrast. So this is after eight hours walking. Uh, an hour after this, our guys decided they no longer wanted to be with us and left us in the forest, in the dark, in the rain. Um, so sometimes it's, uh, it's no fun. But when you do put the extra effort in, you find some interesting things. So this is Coffee Atoshii. This was found in, um, in 2009. And this is, the coffee is this big. You know, the, the plant is this big. A tiny little coffee. Um, yeah, quite exciting. But go to Western Madagascar, and then things really start to, to kick off. As I've said, Western Madagascar is very dry. Um, but in the wet season, it's very, very wet. It's quite an interesting ecology. And what we found there surprised everybody. This, these are actually coffee species. Uh, they have these very bizarre fruits that like ice creams or, I don't know, I, think, I don't know how to describe them. But inside is a coffee bean. So we know that they're coffees. Perhaps... Uh, the most interesting coffee for me was coffee ambongensis. This is found in that very dry habitat I showed before, 40 degrees C in, in the summer. has these pear-shaped fruits. It's a deciduous species. And inside these fruits, which is about the size of a, a walnut, I suppose, um, there's these brain-like seeds. You know, totally bizarre. And if you compare them with Arabica, wow, these guys are gin ginormous. So this is Blue Mountain, this is Ambongensis, and this turned out to be the largest coffee bean in the world, and only discovered in Madagascar in 2001, um, and described in 2008. So Madagascar was very exciting. Uh, about the same time, it, I kind of realized that Actually, Africa was still a bit underexplored. The mascarines were still, you know, a little bit unknown. This is Coffea macrocarpa from, um, from Mauritius. This has a single stem, no leaves on the bottom, a few leaves at the top. These big flowers and, and large fruits. It's quite an interesting species. We went to East Africa, to Western Madagascar. This is uh, Cameroon. This is Coffea brevipes, a species related to Liberica. So as I was working on the African species, colleagues of mine and a bit of work that I did, we were also describing species in West Africa and also in East Africa. This is Coffea montecupensis. So the net result is we went from sort of 80 odd species to 103 species in just 10 years. If you go back a little bit further, you know, we're going from 40 species to over 100 species, which is quite remarkable in, in the modern age. So wild coffee species are restricted to Africa and Madagascar, and here are the mascarines. And in fact, 
Madagascar has more species on its, uh, than any other area combined. So it's big, even, though Mad even though the area for coffee in Africa is big, for wild species is big, uh, Madagascar has more species. And in fact, I'm working on some more species at the moment, and that will soon be up to uh, 70 species. So that's our first question answered. How many coffee species are there? The answer is quite a lot. But what is coffee? Yes? I feel We're working on six more new species from an unexplored area in the north, but I kind of think it's, it's tailed off. I think it's, we might get a few more, but I think we're reaching the peak. Yeah. So what is coffee? I don't, when I was collecting these bizarre coffees, it always worried me that, you know what, maybe these aren't coffees. You know, maybe, they're not, maybe they're in some other group. Maybe they're not related to Arabica or Robusta. The coffee family itself actually contains about 16,000 species. So you've got the coffee itself. You've got the coffee family, which are species related to coffee, distantly related to coffee, and there are lots of them. So amongst those 16,000 species, is there something or are there other species that are coffees? Or those things in Madagascar, maybe they're not coffees. Who knows? And in the past, things like Calicosophonia and Argocoffeopsis were considered by uh, scientists to be coffees. So when you see that reduction in the number of species in the original chart, that was because these things were actually once considered coffee and actually roasted and consumed, believe it or not, and then decided that they weren't coffees. But it's, it bugs me that maybe they are, maybe the Madagascar, some of the Madagascan species aren't what they seem to be. If you look at these plants um, in the living state, actually they do have characteristics that remind you of coffee. You know, to the flowers, but also the fruits and the structure of many other parts. And the way to really resolve those issues about um, you know, the delimitation of what is coffee is to look at DNA. And what we do is we look at a section of DNA that evolves very slowly um, that can tell us the history of that species or that individual through time. So we're looking for uh, a low mutation rate over thousands or even millions, well, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of years. And what we're doing is we're identifying the base um, the bases within the DNA and reading the code, just like the DNA um, human barcode project, but we're not looking at millions of base pairs, we're looking at maybe five, ten thousand. And in fact, you can build a tree of life using DNA. So we're all related, we're all related to everything else. In fact, we're related to coffee. Some of us perhaps more than others, but we share 50% of our DNA with with a coffee bean. We share 70% of our DNA with a housefly. It's an interesting, interesting concept. So what does that look like for, for coffee? Well, we screened all the suspects that we thought might be coffee or related to coffee. And what we came up with, what we came up with was the coffee tribe. So here we have all the relatives of coffee. And many of these were considered coffees at one time. But what we're left with is a solid core of, of coffee. And what defines this group morphologically are the presence of coffee beans. And people with good eyesight will see, uh, hang on, there's a problem here. We've got this Silanthus closely related to our coffee species. If you look at these species, you'll see, well, actually, they're, they're pretty out there. I mean. This thing, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like any coffee I knew. This is an in a species from India. It's deciduous, has little purple berries. But they all have a coffee bean. And when you look back into the archives and into the early literature, people in Africa and India roast these and use them as coffee. So, and, you know, and a molecular from a molecular viewpoint, they've just evolved independently a number of times within the coffee genus. So 
they are coffees, and they have coffee beans. And when you roast them, they smell more or less like coffee. So up until 2010, we thought that coffee was an African Indian Ocean group, but in fact now it extends right the way over to Australia. And the Australians were really happy that they had their own <coughs> coffee species. Um, I didn't hear back from the Indonesians or the Indians, but, they, but there was quite a lot of media attention about uh, coffee abrasii from, from Queensland. So here we are. Now we've jumped up again. So 103 species. If you add those Asian, a few more African, Australian species in, you go up to 124 species. Just to conclude this part, then, that's great, but we want more precision. We want to develop coffee as a crop, as, a, as, a, as an experience. We need, to, we need more precision, we need more information. So we need to know how coffee species are related to each other. The big question... Um, sorry, what's going on here? Um, there we go. Big question for... Um, Many people who, who work in coffee is, what is the origin of Arabica? And one of the things we're able to do during this study, because we sampled so many wild species, uh, we were able to pinpoint with some precision the parents of the hybrid Arabica. So here we have Robusta from um, West Africa and Eugenioides from East Africa. And now we're pretty certain that these are the parents. They were always suggested that, well, not always, but often suggested that these were the parents. Maybe it was Congensis, maybe Antonii, but these are the most likely suspects. Arabica is not only a hybrid, it's an allotetraploid. And what that means is uh, during or uh, the hybridization event, the chromosomes have doubled. And what that means is that it has uh, vigor. It's also self-compatible. So it doesn't need a, a, a bee to cross-pollinate to make fruits, which is a great agronomical trait. And what you see is the species are arranged into nice, neat geographical groupings, West Africa, East Africa, Madagascar. And you can even go as far as to pinpoint specific species groups, like the Liberica group and the Robusta group. And if we're interested in coffee as a crop, this is where we want to be. West Africa and East Africa. Those are where the beverage species come from. Madagascar, lots of species, but the coffee tastes absolutely disgusting. So the, what's happened is that uh, the chemistry of these coffees have changed during their evolution. They don't have caffeine, or very little uh, amounts of caffeine. To counter that, the plants produced other chemicals. So when you drink a cup of uh, Madagascan wild coffee, yeah, it's really acidic and pretty, pretty much undrinkable. The locals do drink a few uh, wild species, but uh, for speciality coffee, it's not going to work. Uh, that said, <laughs> there's, some, there's been a lot of interest in this from the big, the, big, the big guys. Let's just have a closer look at origin. Um, Look at our favorite species. As I've said, it's a hybrid between a West African group and an East African group, specifically Robusta and Eugenioides. Again, I'm really keen on detail and precision. If you look at this, in, uh, if you can see, but I can explain it. Uh, the Robusta comes from the Canophora Alliance in West Africa. And although it said East Africa for you for Eugenioides, it actually comes from a group of species which is on the Rift Valley and in, and in the Congo. So it's a little bit more, geographic, uh, more of a geographical element than I would indi otherwise indicate in the other slide. Um, yeah, there you go. Does that make sense? It sure does. This is Robusta and Eugenioides. If we look at Arabica, it looks somewhere intermediate. The leaves are, yeah intermediate between the small-leaved Eugenioides and the big-leaved Robusta. In a geographical sense, in an ecological context, that also makes sense. This is the real and predicted distribution of Robusta. 
And what you'll see here, um, oh, move again, is that it actually predicts the, the, the model predicts the distribution of Arabica. So does Eugenioides. This is the Eugenioides. It's predicting that Ethiopian um, group up in the top. And sure enough, there's our data for wild Arabica put on the top of the model. So it all fits really quite nicely. If you look at the, where these two species have been recorded, you'll see there's lots of places where they overlap and could, could occur in the same places. In fact, they, are, they can be still be found in the same forests living together. It seems odd that uh, Arabica, the, the origin of Arabica seems to be down to one single hybridization event. So it has a single origin, we believe, um, based on the present data. So you don't find Arabica down in the Rift Valley anymore. It's all in Ethiopia. So when people uh, uh, query me about the distribution of wild Arabica, it's all in Ethiopia, apart from one uh, isolated locality in South Sudan. But that's, you know, that, that's pretty close <laughs> to uh, Ethiopia. This one down here, Mount Marsabit, that's probably cultivated. It's just way too far away from the range. And the molecular data suggests that uh, the plants there are related to crops um, uh, from the, that we, found, we find in uh, plantations around the world. So to, to summarize then, what is coffee? Coffee is uh, a plant with coffee-like flower and most importantly, coffee beans. There are 124 species. And uh, if you look at the family tree, the genealogy based on DNA, you can see how each species is related to the next. So that's great. That's fantastic. Um, scientifically, that's very um, uh, interesting. Um, but uh, the big question is, so what? Why have we done all this work? What's the point for you guys? What's the point for the farmers? Um, you know, what information does it give us that helps us progress coffee through this century and beyond? So I'll leave it there. We're going to do some cupping. Uh, and then afterwards, I'm going to try and come back and answer some of those questions. <laughs> the so what. Uh, is, is Tim here? So we've got some coffees to cup. Um, we didn't get exactly what we wanted. No. We wanted to try some uh, other species, but they're real difficult to get hold of. I mean, really difficult to get hold of. But we've got an interesting selection. Uh, I think the taste is going to be <laughs> interesting. We'll interesting. A, we'll okay. This. Fantastic. Yeah. Do you want to say something, or are you going to? Okay. Fantastic. Okay, thanks for your attention, and if anybody's got a quick question. Um, yeah, it's a good question. When I first started, I wasn't really into coffee, <coughs> and I didn't <coughs> proactively go and try and source and find coffees to taste them. But there were times when, yeah, I did taste them. Um, but, you know, if, if I could go back, <laughs> I, would be, I would have been more proactive about uh, tasting coffees. And there are some in Madagascar which are said to have good cut profiles. And I was there, I could have, you know, could have done something about it. Um, but, it, yeah, and, and these days I, I, I try and gather beans and... and Get them roasted and try them. And uh, sorry, I've been given the mic <laughs> once again. Uh, and I, I guess when you're seeing these wild plants, um, how frequently are you finding uh, these specific species in in actual harvestable quantities? Meaning, like, you know, let's say at least a dozen trees. Fairly infrequently. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
what you tend to find is uh, trees very widely spaced within a forest system, or maybe six or seven grouped together, and then nothing for 20 minutes walking, and then another group, and a very specific, even in within the same forest, they might be a valley floor species or a, or a, a ridge species, or a, a, a species that occurs by the riverbank. Yeah. But I think you could, if in fruiting season, if the birds haven't got them, or, or the lemurs or the monkeys haven't got them, then you could, yeah, you could put a kilo together within a few hours. But the, the trouble is that once those berries are ripe, <coughs> they're gone. Right. You know, because the birds uh, and the lemurs, etc., uh, want them. And it's it's interesting in um, in Madagascar, the, the the ripening time is very short, much much shorter than Africa. So it'll they'll flower in November. November, mid-November, late November. By January, they're ripe and ready. Wow. Very short fructification time. That's... Uh. <laughs> Was there a difference in taste between the north and the... Uh, of between the dry and the wet section of Madahaska? Uh, or didn't you really... No, well, it's difficult to make the comparison because they're just <coughs> such different... The uh, species in the in the wet forest just don't occur in the dry forest. Yeah, but it's very but specific. They're really different. In, in, in did you taste them? No. I didn't taste many of the western okay. species. Yeah. No. no. I'll just, I'll just yeah. Sorry, I'll just continue really quickly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I guess you you said the coffee taste were not really of of any high quality, but I, I, is it? I mean, is it possible that that could just be a product of them being unripe or poorly processed? So, in in uh, east of Madagascar, there's a very nice research institute uh, at Kianjavato, and they hold about I don't know 50 species, 50 wild species, and some other, you know. Arabica, in, in a garden. Cultures, in a botanical garden, in a coffee research station. And people have based themselves there for five years, doing breeding, cupping, and, uh, and it hasn't pr produced any uh, good results. So uh, you would assume they'd gone to some lengths to, to make sure the processing was good and the roasting was good, but I, I, I don't know for sure, but I think people have certainly put some work into it and not got very far. And, and just uh, one last question. What, what, what is the sort of average elevation that you're finding most of these uh, plants at? Because uh, Madagascar is mostly quite close to sea level. Is, is that correct? Uh, it's So Madagascar, if you, uh, as you come in from the Indian Ocean side, there's a very steep escarpment going from sea level to 1,600 meters. Okay. And then that tails off towards the west. So actually, most of it's quite high. It's actually quite high, yeah. Yeah, but it, t it yeah, no, apart from the west, is, is goes from, yeah, 500 meters to zero, kilometer, zero meters above altitude. But species could be found by the beach. They can be found at 2,000 meters. And in nearly, nearly any habitat. They've really diversified in Madagascar, really evolved very quickly, very... Uh, you know, profusely in terms of their characters. Excellent. Thank you. Any more questions? Coming? Okay. Let's go.